today's episode of Buried Treasures, we're going to take a look at a floppy disk image that I recently put out there and will still continue working on. But this is the first uh, draft of this phaser MIDI disk. Okay, and there is an assembler listing as well, which we will follow as we look at it. So, um, I first became interested in the phaser card um, when it came out uh, by Reactive Micro, and um, I had written an article for Juice GS, so you could download it in this repository and learn how you program the phaser sound card. <clears throat> now the nice thing about it is it's like having two mocking boards, and um, you program it by poking very similar to the way you poke the registers of a mockingbird. And then this article that was in the magazine um, gives you an overview, and then there's a supplement which goes more into detail about the coding and what each register does. So you actually have 12 sound channels, and um, by poking them, you can do a lot of different sound effects and music. So this example here plays a chord. And um, what I wanted to do was to have the phaser controlled by a MIDI instrument. Now, MIDI is a standard for music data created by synthesizers. And the um, Apple has a uh, Passport MIDI interface, which I had back in the day and is now produced in Bulgaria. Thank you, Plamen. A to heaven when it's available. So um, I learned how to program that Passport MIDI in assembly language, and I wrote my own sequencer and other code for the music that I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do now was to use the 12 voices on the phaser card to be played by the um, MIDI input from a piano. Now here is a demo of what it sounds like when this code is run. So the disk image boots up like this. It runs DOS Toolkit, and you could see the opening screen, but I make you type an E if you want to go into the assembler. If you hit return, it'll just give you a catalog of the disk and exit. So on that disk image, there's a basic program here called phasermidi.bas. So you could load that and list it. Okay, you need to be in uppercase. BAS. So the source code for that assembler code is in these two files, phasermidi.sc0 and sc1. And I edit those using Apple Writer 2E. And these are Apple Writer 2E macros, which will add line numbers or take off line numbers. So like if you get an error in the assembler, you could find out what the source code is for the line that had the error. Okay, but um, this is what you would run if you have both cards in your Apple 2E or 2GS. And what it does, it first runs a program that I wrote many years ago, which just um, displays a piano display in mouse text. So let me just show you what that looks like. B run P 
piano.2800. That's the hex address where it loads, and then it pokes onto the mouse text screen. So you have a piano display, and then like if you hover over these, you're going to see the characters that are used in the mouse text to create those um, character graphics. So um, that was my design thinking I, I wanted to see full 88 key keyboard on the Apple II screen, and that's the design I came up with. Okay, so um, that's just the background. Eventually the code will poke in the letters of the note. It, it, I want to show the MIDI channels of the notes being played. Now I've done that in other um, programs, but I want to get it done working for this as an enhancement. So the code right now is just basic. Uh, it, it's um, just taking the MIDI data and uh, playing it through the phaser. Now, how do you translate MIDI notes into phaser frequencies? That's what this mocktune.dat is for. So I'm going to load that. OK, so I decided to keep that as a separate file because maybe you want to create separate tuning files. Like maybe you want to tune to a different frequency. It was 432 or 444, 528. For, there are various tunings that are out there that you can actually uh, do on a mocking board or a phaser. So this is the standard tuning. And it's loaded at 6400. and um, there are 127 possible MIDI notes. So if I go to um, 647F, this is 127 bytes. Now these are the low bytes of the frequency. Now if you look here, this is the highest note, and um, these are lower notes, but you see starting here at F4, if the high byte is zero, then these are the tunings starting at a C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, going forward, all the way up to a high, uh, whatever, G or... Um, so anything below that, it has another, a different value, like a 1, 2, 3, going up to an F. And if you to see those, that starts at 6480.64FF. Okay, so you can see the high bytes going from 1 through F. I think the Mockingboard manual goes around seven, but I figured out by doubling the frequencies to get lower notes, because I wanted to get that lowest register of the piano, but I don't have the lowest three notes. Okay, so that's the tuning file. And I want to list. Okay, so now the code, when it's assembled, it, I loaded at phaser MIDI dot object. Bload phaser MIDI dot object. Okay, and this loads at hex six thousand, so twenty four five seven six is that value, and then it just prints. It, it so it shows the screen, goes to the bottom of the screen, prints a message, and then calls another entry point. So that's six thousand three. So if we go into the monitor. 6,000 list. So when you B run the code, it goes to this initialization routine and 6,003 goes here. And then um, there are three other entry points that are useful for testing. So let's see, do I have the code up? Yeah. So um, you could download this text file from GitHub as well. It's a PDF file. So you can see the entry points there's some equates up here, but here they are jump main and jump check MIDI. But then there's a panic routine. What is panic? That's if you have a bunch of notes playing that you don't, won't, don't want playing, they're being held and not turning off, you panic. And you jump to panic and it turns everything off. And then I wanted two test routines to test um, playing a note on and a note off on the phaser directly. So think about when you play a chord, like you put your thumb on a C, your middle finger on an E, and your pinky on a G. So maybe the C comes in first, so that's a note on for the C, and then the E comes in, and then the G. So those three are all down. So um, when the first C comes in, you need to allocate a sound channel 
for that C. And then when the E comes in, you want to keep the C playing, but also play an E on a different sound channel. And then when the G comes in, you need a third channel. And then when you lift up your fingers, you don't know which one you're lifting up first, but uh, you could turn off the sounds on the channel that's playing that note and free up that channel for use in future notes. So like going from a C major to a D minor, you're going to you free up three channels and then you're going to press the D F A. So those will, those can reuse the three channels that you used, uh, assuming you took your fingers off all those notes before you started playing it. So in a MIDI file, you could have multiple channels of music coming through. So you're going to be um, allocating up to the 12 available voices. So I had previously written a version of this for the Mockingboard, and that only allowed six voices to play simultaneously. But there are piano pieces where you have seven fingers down, and uh, you could do chords of eight fingers and uh, extended chords of ten. Well, we have ten fingers, but uh, if you mix it, multiple parts together in a sequencer, you can get like 24 notes playing at once. So a, a synthesizer will have all that logic and more voices. But what's nice is that we have 12 voices to use. And um, eventually I'd like to like uh, extend that um, using other computers like a VIC-20 or a C64 to play some of the music on a SID. But that's another project. To get started, I, um, yeah, I wanted a test harness so I can uh, test allocating these voices and uh, a test byte. So like if I'm not running this main loop that's checking all the time for MIDI input, I can test one byte at a time. So um, if it's an FF, then it's going to use the passport MIDI for everything that comes through. Otherwise, I'm just going to poke a byte a, like a nine zero and that would uh, go first. I could run the routine and then, um, yeah, so I designed this check MIDI routine to handle either you're playing real time or you're testing. And the code had to accommodate that by looking at this MIDI test byte. And then um, I have, uh, for future expansion, I want to be able to press some keys on the keyboard. So right now, AppleSoft can read a key press. Um, but um, I want to have things like for soloing or muting. So like say I want to only play MIDI channel 4 coming through, which is usually like an instrumental. Um, so I would put a 3 in solo channel, because in hex, the uh, channels are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so then I have um, space set aside for the notes that are on. Up to 12 notes can be on at the same time. Which notes are on for each voice? And then velocities. So if you have a velocity sensitive keyboard, when you press a note, it will register how hard you press that note. And that's called a velocity, which is equivalent to a volume. So like if you press that C really hard, it can go all the way up to 7F. Um, if you press it softer, you may get like a 2-0 or a 3-0. So I want to store those velocities and translate them into volume parameters for each note. Okay, and then some internal variables using to some accounting of the data coming through. So I actually created a state machine where depending on what phase you're in, it will take a different path through the state machine and set it up for the next state. So for example, when you receive a 9-0, that means you have a note on message coming through and the protocol says that the next byte is the note and the next byte is the velocity. So um, yeah, so I wanna change the phase each, for each byte so I know what to do with the next byte that comes across. Okay, and then um, the first free element in note on and note velocities. So um, I needed to know where is my free byte, free um, pointer. So um, there's a routine that checks to find a free slot.
where I can poke in a new note to be played on a new channel. Okay, and then I needed to map certain parameters for the phaser, like um, the chip numbers. There are four chips um, for um, the uh, four of the AY chips that play the music, and that's an amazing chip. Uh, the general instrument sound register, and I love the pure tone it has. So um, the three of the voices are on chip one, three of them are on chip two, and the same for three and four. And then I needed the offset, so the register numbers that you poke for each chip. So the first voice is eight, the second voice is nine, the third voice is 10. That's where you poke the velocity, which is a volume, which is a nibble from zero to 15, or a 16 if you're doing envelopes that are built into the chip. But I'm not doing envelopes in this program. So here, if I know which slot I get, I can say, okay, I'm gonna use chip two and register nine to store the volume of the note that I just read from MIDI. And then the note number has to translate into a frequency. So we saw that data file of the tuning. So there are two bytes that you need, a high byte and a low byte. And this shows the register numbers for each channel of where you poke the note. So zero and one are for the first channel of chip one, and then two and three are for the second channel, and four and five are for the third channel. So the tunings that I read from that data go into these values. And then, that, so each of the phaser sound chips has um, 13 bytes that are used to create sounds. So like here, following through zero and one, these two bytes are a C, these two bytes are an E, and these two bytes are a G. Then there's a noise channel, which you can use for drum sounds, but I'm not using it. This byte here is called the enable, which tells it which channels to enable for tone and or noise. So this value means all three channels are being enabled for tone. If I wanted to mix tone and noise, I could set a different value there, okay? And then there are more bytes after that, which talk about uh, noise periods and envelopes. So, but to play, okay, the, these three are the volume, and that's all that you really need. If you're just gonna be poking in notes and volumes, that's all you need to do to make music, so. I created these four areas for experimenting and also for debugging. So if I do a test where I send a specific sequence of bytes and I want to see what happens to the phaser values, I can look in these areas of memory. So I will be writing AppleSoft test cases that send a bunch of sequences of bytes to test all the different conditions and then peeking at these red these values here to see if it does what I expect. So like if I play a D minor chord and um, it gets assigned to chip two, I would expect to see the values for the D chord in these three bytes. I would expect to see these three set to the velocity that I poked in uh, from AppleSoft. So that's another goal of this is to create a test harness to automatically test so if I make changes to this code, I can rerun my tests and see if anything broke. Okay, and then the rest of this code, I can go through at another time, but uh, there's some cute things here like panic, jump to phaser, stop one, two, three, and four. Because I could have up to 12 sounds playing on these chips. So what is phaser top one? Um, so there's phaser output routines and uh, Oh, stop, pH stop one. So here I'm taking uh, register eight, poking it with a zero and calling phaser out one. And then I am, um, yeah, so here's the, the one that we would call the phaser stop two. So I'm calling a different routine phaser out two. So 
Here I set it up so I could just pass the X register, has the register number, and the Y has the data. And calling this subroutine will poke a zero into the volume for the first channel. Then increment X will make that 8 into a 9 and then into a 10. So it will um, poke this zero into 9 and 10 as well, and that will stop that chip. So if I call the stop routine for all four chips, it'll do the panic button. Okay, and then just looking through what the rest of the code is, um, handling note ons and note offs, and um, yeah, what to do to turn off. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, here's some note on data. So it says X is the MIDI note number, Y is the MIDI velocity. So to turn on a note, it has to convert that velocity from a, a byte to a nibble, and this is how it does that. And uh, then, uh, so I put comments, so for people reading this, um, so the key thing is, yeah, how do I know that all these assembly instructions are going to do what they're supposed to? And there was something that I couldn't test um, without using a real keyboard, and I'll show you where that is, this, this active sensing. Okay, so the problem I was having was, okay, it looked like the logic was working, but when I hooked it up to a real keyboard, it wasn't um, accurately um, processing the notes. Like I'd play a note and then I'd take my finger off and it would still be playing. And the problem was there were real time messages coming through from my MIDI keyboard there was an active sensing message, an FE, that was stuck between that and that was messing up my logic. So I had to pull, put this logic in to um, yeah, go back to the top of the loop if it gets any byte over F8. Okay, um, this is checking the keyboard. It'll store a keyboard command, but that's gonna have to get called more frequently uh, in the current version. So here's some phase logic, different phases. I'm just picking different bytes, like uh, 81 is the first byte of a note off, 92 is the second byte of either a note on or a note off. And uh, it starts with phase FF, which is just, we don't know what's on the stream yet, get a MIDI byte and see what it is. And I'm only processing note ons and note offs currently. I will expand this to process things like program changes, controller changes, because currently those are interfering with the logic. Okay, so it took a while to get this logic working. And then there's also something called running status. Some instruments, like if you set a note on 903C40, well, then you don't have to repeat the 90. You could just send uh, like a 3E40, 4040 as data bytes without a status byte in between. So I have to handle that as well. So EdSM says successful assembly, no errors, and gives you a cross reference map when you're done. So it also points out things that I'm not using, like the solo channel I've defined, but I'm not using it in my code. And do note on is not being used, interestingly. Okay, so if I want to clean up my code, I could do that. All right, so you get the idea. And um, I will also show you how I can test this in Virtual 2 using the inspector. Virtual 2 has something, uh, an amazing little thing, show inspector. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Okay, you could set a breakpoint. Boy, would people have killed for this in 1979. 6003. Okay. And then you can do your 6000G and your 6003G, and it hits your breakpoint. How about that? And then you put your memory 6000. You can see all the contents of your memory. And then you can run your program step by step. You can step into each instruction. So here we're at 6003, we're gonna jump to 62D9. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, step into, and here we are, 62D9. We're going to load from 600F, and you can see here it has an FF. So we load, step into it, and the accumulator has an FF. This was Wozniak's dream, to have everything you need visible on the screen at once. That was the aim of the Apple One, <laughs> and it's in the advertising. You could see up to this many registers and memory locations. <laughs> okay, before you had to keep track of it on paper and cross things out when they change and figure out what the program was doing. Okay, so we're comparing the accumulator to an FF, and it is equal to that. This is a branch if not equal, but it is equal, so we're not going to take that branch. We're going to go down here and jump to a subroutine. The subroutine is at 62E6, which is down here. So we're going to jump to this subroutine, and then we're going to jump back to 62CD. Okay, so this is what uh, reads the MIDI keyboard and processes one phase, and then we jump back to the loop, and then based on the phase the next time, we'll know what to do with the next byte that we read. Okay, so let's first go in here and read. Okay, but we first need to check something. 602A. Here's 202A is an FF. That's your current phase, and the default phase when you start is an FF. Okay, because we don't know where you are, and so it's like an initial status. Okay, so now we're comparing. Is that, we got an FF, is it a 91? No, it isn't. So we're not going to take that path. Is it an 81? No, we're not going to take that path. Is it a 92? Nope. Is it a 90? Nope. Okay, we're, if it's not equal, we're going to go to 62FF down here. If it was, then we're going to do this code, which is for that status byte. But we're going here because it's an unknown status byte. Of FF. So we're going to jump to 62B6 subroutine. And here, the first thing we're going to do is check this mode. Are we, do we have an FF? If we do, that means we want, we are playing real time through a phaser, uh, through a, a MIDI keyboard. We're not running the test routines. So I'm going to step into this. Okay, now, is it an FF? Yes. So it's going, it's equal, it's going to go down here. Um, okay, so here is the code that reads the phaser register, I mean the MIDI registers from the Passport MIDI interface. So the, um, this is a little technical, it's uh, a control register and a data register, and it's checking the low bit of the control register, and that means receive data register full, so that as the serial interface receives bits, it'll come to a point where it received eight bits, and that's a byte. So then it'll set that received data register full. So here I'm just pulling that value. Um, if it's equal to zero, I stay in this loop. So let's see what I get. So I got a zero, and I don't know, this is just simulating what's doing in um, Virtual 2. So if it's zero, I end it with one, I stay, it stays a zero, and it's still equal to zero. So I go back, and I read another one, and I read another one, and um, eventually it will change, and it will load a data register. And um, what I want to do is put a breakpoint here. Okay, so let's resume. And it's in an infinite loop. Okay. <laughs> So I can do a break, can I? Yeah, break. OK, so I can modify memory here. So let's do this. So let's uh, load this, and let's modify the CPU. Ooh, go into the CPU and change something. Uh-oh. Let's put a 1 in the A register. OK, um, okay load that and then change it to a 1, and I have to hit Apply. Okay, so now I step, and now the Z register, okay, so, and did it, I have a 1, 1 is not equal to 0. 
Okay, so now I load C0A9, but now I'm going to modify that value to something that I want to test, like a 9-0. Okay, and now is that an F8 or greater? Okay, so um, it's not. So the carry is not set. The carry is clear. If it was greater or equal, the carry would be set. So I branch, uh, I don't go take that branch, I do a return. So now I have a byte in the accumulator, which is a MIDI byte. And this is one way I can test by uh, intercepting that. Or I can just poke it into that data register from AppleSoft instead of doing this. But this is uh, how I initially test. So 9-0, is it an 80? Okay, it's greater than 80, so the carry is set. Is the carry clear? No, it's not. Is it an A0 or greater? Carry is clear. But if the carry was set, that means that this accumulator was over A0, um, higher than A0. So it's clear, so I'm not taking that branch, so I'm going to store this accumulator in 602B. And there it is, 9-0. Okay. And then uh, I then check again, is it a 9-0? Um, let's see. Okay, so carry set. Um, so it's, it's doing some phase logic. Okay, I just set my phase, and here is the next phase to 9-1. So that's the next state of my state machine. I return. And now I'm jumping back to the top of that loop and I'm checking my keyboard at this time to see if I pressed a key. Okay. And now I'm back at the logic that uh, is going to call that subroutine again, get the next MIDI byte, and then jump. So this is how I test. I, when I hit that next breakpoint, um, yeah, I have to do this. So yeah, if I uh, then make this a 1. So this will be for the next MIDI byte. I'm just going to follow that through. All right, step into. OK, so load A with a 1. And and it. And OK, so now we get a byte. And I want this A to be a 4-3. OK, that would be the note E. OK, so let's just follow this through. OK, so now we return. And we store it 602C. So here is the data byte. Okay. So the next byte will be the velocity. So we need to set our phase. So we're going to change this 91 to a 92. Step into. And we've got a 92 as our next phase. We return and just keep going through the state machine. Okay. And that's basically the first um, iteration of this code.